Montana Talks here. here. Live and local. This is Montana Talks with Aaron Flint. This is where Montana Talks. Montana Talks with Aaron Flint. All right, we got uh, plenty of time to take your phone calls here later this morning, uh, starting around seven thir- uh, seven thirty. Yeah, and then uh, we'll have open phones time in the eight o'clock hour of the show, uh, show and in the nine o'clock hour as well. Uh, always fun uh, to have uh, some time where we just take your phone calls, especially after a busy show on Friday. We had so many great folks. Drop by and join us on the show uh, live from the Hilton Garden Inn in Bozeman, and then, and then a lot of folks just drop by to say hello as well. So so great to see all of our uh, listeners on fourteen fifty KMMS on Friday, and then great time with the uh, Gallatin County Republican Women's uh, Luncheon on Friday as well. First, so let's get back to business. We've got Evelyn Pyburn with the Big Sky Business Journal joining us uh, on the phone lines. Evelyn, great to have you on the show. What's the uh, what's the big story this morning? Well, uh, we have uh, two or three. Uh, the hot sheet has uh, a report that, well, I'm going to, well, I don't know if either of these are really good stories, so, but uh, Riverstone uh, health, the city county health department is laying off people and, um, they have notified 29 employees that they will be part of a reduction in the workforce effective mid June. And, um, and this is due to the fact that they, uh, have to reduce costs because their budget has lost more than $3 million in Medicaid revenue this fiscal year. And, um, In total, Riverstone Health reports they have cut almost 9% of their workforce, including employees already impacted by prior layoffs. In a press release, the health department said that like other hospitals and healthcare organizations, Riverstone Health is experiencing the same impacts of inflation and of rising costs, lower than expected patient volumes for primary care services, and stagnant reimbursement rates from Medicaid, which began a year ago. Employees affected by the layoffs are receiving a support package that includes a 30-day notice and um, assistance to in um, support services as they transition to hopefully other positions. Yeah, well, I'm assuming the other uh, hospitals and healthcare facilities in the in town. Are, are are still in need of staff, right? So I'm a, a, hopefully a, any, anybody who's maybe lost their job has has other opportunities uh, in you know in Billings as well, where Riverstone Health is located. If if not at least uh, here in the region, I'm I'm just assuming that there's still a huge staffing need. Yes, I heard that, and so hopefully there won't be too much of a a problem in getting other positions, but. Um, I, I wonder how much of this was impacted, like, you know, like we've seen with some of these school districts where they inflated their budgets with one-time funds. Right. And, and then now that the one-time funds are going away, uh, they they realize, like, oh, whoops, we could why did we hire long-time staff with one-time funds? I wonder if that's an angle. I'm not saying it is. I just I wonder if that's an angle here with these Riverstone health layoffs as well. But certainly... They specifically mention inflation, the Joe Biden, John Tester inflation, one of the reasons here. Interesting. I'm Chad Pergram with the Speaker's Lobby. Expect consequences from Capitol Hill for universities which fail to protect their students. Republican lawmakers believe the federal government is slow to probe probable civil rights violations on campus. The GOP demands action. That's why they pressed Education Secretary Miguel Cardona about what the Biden administration has done to uphold Title VI of the Civil Rights Act and combat anti-Semitism on campus. Cardona says he needs more investigators. He says the number of cases has tripled since 2009. Cardona has asked for an additional $22 million in this spending cycle to hire more investigators and open up more probes. Expect that to be a flashpoint. Democrats say the GOP tried to cut funding for the department by 25%. The end result was flat funding. The GOP also wants to slash money for universities, which they believe failed to protect Jewish students. That's why the GOP is ready to curb money bound for colleges as lawmakers prep spending bills for this fall. But there's a schism among Democrats over the Middle East, and that divide threatens to shred the Democrats' coalition ahead of the election. With the Speaker's Lobby, Chad Pergram, Fox News.
serving the great state of Montana. From the peaks of the Bear Tooths to the banks of the Clark Fork River, Montana Talks with Aaron Flint. Yeah, this is a, a very, a very interesting information here. Riverstone Health layoffs uh, here in the Big Sky Business Journal hot sheet. Riverstone Health is not immune to the impacts of inflation, rising costs, lower than expected patient volumes for primary care services, and stagnant reimbursement rates have been exacerbated by the Medicaid redetermination process that began in April of 2023. Uh, so, yeah, uh, 29 employees uh, are a part of this reduction in force effective mid-June. But, yeah, Evelyn, you and I were kind of talking about this during the break. Several reasons why this is happening here. Uh, very interesting that Joe Biden and John Tester's in massive inflation is one of the main reasons why Riverstone Health is having these layoffs, right? But I've noticed just in following the, the Montana politics hashtag on Twitter, all the Democrats and the liberal uh, news outfits are trying to blame this on Governor Greg Gianforte. And that's why I, I, I think it's interesting that a lot of these programs, there, there were a lot of these one-time funded programs that do, came about just because of the craziness that was the uh, COVID-19. And like some of these liberal school districts, some of these places made long-term staffing decisions and long-term budgeting decisions based on one-time funds. And and now – and then when those one-time funds go away, they're like, oh, oh, the, I, 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 is that part of the story here? Well, probably. Um, I had the same thought when I was reading, it, reading this originally. Uh, I was thinking, this is just like the school districts, but, you know – Maybe they um, maybe they aren't so far off to thinking. Oh well, this this will be continued no matter what because so many programs, one time funding, do get extended and 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 these people kind of expect it and and so this is something of a surprise that holy cow they really did mean it when they said one time funding. So um, well, and it reminds yeah, me too of when it reminds me too of when. A certain health officer at Riverstone Health was ordering businesses to be shut down, and and uh, and think of all the pain and havoc that caused for a lot of employers and employees and working folks who who you know who had to experience that turmoil. And so I, you know, you hate to you know you know say that well because I'm sure there's there's good folks who who are losing their jobs yeah. here, but but it's also a reminder that if we get Donald Trump back in and we get our economy back up and rolling and rocking and rolling again and start to deal with this inflation, heck yeah, even if you you work at Riverstone Health and you're not a Donald Trump fan, hey, uh, you know maybe it's time to to change your uh, voting habits here right and and that shut down on demanded of businesses. It was far more dramatic and, and consequential. I mean, and those people, you know, they still, they are still struggling and there are businesses that don't exist now because of that. So, um, That's yeah, right. it's just a lesson that this is not a good way to deal with crises. So, That's uh, right. Uh, speaking of COVID-19, you know, um, one of the, I guess you could say good things or you know, maybe a bad thing, depending on how you look at it. But I, I think it's a good thing. I think the fact that more people are allowed to work remotely and not have to drive into an office every day necessarily. I mean, I, I, I enjoy being part of a team and and and, you know, having a place to go to. But I, the flexibility is good. But there's a lot of people now that, hey. I can live out in Warden, Montana, and not have to commute into Billings for work. That's great, right? And you know, and and, it, and then you're saving gas money and everything else. But but uh, uh, but now apparently there's there's lawsuits. Some employees who've been who've been ordered to return to the office do not want to return to the office, so they're suing their employers. Apparently, yes, this is coming from the Washington Post. And they say that after more than two years of resisting employers' demands to return to the office, employees have started suing their employers. And um, much of the time, the uh, employees, though, who are suing, they have medical conditions or other extenuating circumstances about which they believe the employers are failing to take into consideration. So 
they claim that cases of losing jobs because of their refusal to return to the office are actually instances of discrimination. Um, but there are also claims that in some <laughs> discrimination. <circumstances>, That's hilarious. <laughs> I mean, if they, if they said, all you white workers better get to the office, everybody else, you can stay home. But you white guys, you better show. OK, then you can claim discrimination. But like if they're telling everybody you got to work at the office, I, that's that's pretty funny. Well, and, and but they are also claiming that in some circumstances, employers are mandating this as it's retaliation for efforts to unionize, which often has been brought about by employees trying to coerce the employers into letting them work at home. So they start trying to organize a union. So um, that's, you know, p part of the uh, uh, push behind this. So um, while there's consider there has been over the past couple of years a lot of push to get employers employees to come back to work, that hasn't seemed to work. Um, in March, nearly 23% of workers did their jobs remotely compared with 19.5% a year ago. So they're kind of losing ground. Yeah, uh, yeah. One human resources officer said some companies haven't adopted policies that account for the burden on parents or caregivers or people who are immunocompromised. Well, and you think now, too, more and more school districts in smaller towns, especially across Montana, are going to four-day uh school uh, right not five day and so uh, you know that will add even more of a push for for remote work so that you have that flexibility all right stand by back with evelyn pyburn from the big sky business journal right after this this is where montana talks at with lane nordland the May World Egg Supply and Demand Estimates report is out, and for the 2024 through 25 marketing year, U.S. corn outlook is calling for a larger supply, greater domestic use in exports and higher ending stocks. The corn crop is projected at 14.9 billion bushels, down 3% from last year, while the yield projection is 181 bushels per acre, while total corn supplies are forecast at 16.9 billion bushels. The season average farm price is down 25 cents to $4.40 a bushel. Join the National Cattlemen's Beef Association. NCBA is the oldest and largest national cattle industry organization working to defend your interests in Washington, D.C. And there are big benefits to being a member. You'll get news you can use in the National Cattlemen, email updates in the NCBA Beef Bulletin, plus big discounts only for NCBA members. Join by calling 866-233-3872 or online at ncba.org. From corn to wheat now in the May World Ag Supply and Demand Estimates Report. The wheat forecast is now forecast at 1.85 billion bushels, up 3% from last year. Yield will be 48.9 bushels per acre, with the season average farm price coming in at $6 per bushel. I'm Lane Northland. Have a great day. Taking your calls live, 406-294-0970. Montana Talks with Aaron Flint. I uh, just got an alert from the New York Times. Donald Trump leads President Biden in five battleground states as the economy and the war in Gaza threaten a Democrat coalition. Oh, so that's why Joe Biden's withholding aid from our friends in Israel. That's why he's undermining a friend and an ally and caving to the Hamas terrorists because he's worried about his election. Forget the 1,400 people who were slaughtered by these terrorists. Forget the 130 uh, people, in, innocent people, uh, still held hostage by these Hamas terrorists. No, no, no. Uh, Joe Biden desperately wants to get reelected. So he has to he has to bow down to the Hamas terrorists in order to try to help his electric. Good night. What a train wreck. Uh, let's jump back into it here. Evelyn Pyburn with the Big Sky Business Journal. Evelyn, you were telling me you just got some new information in the rich state's Poor States report uh, just came out, so you've been looking at the Montana numbers in particular. Yes, I have, and uh, so this year Montana is doing pretty good. We still have room to improve, but 
Montana was ranked 14th in the United States for its economic performance, and which is a, a backward look measuring um, how the state has done in three categories, which are influenced by state policies. But there's another ranking in which Montana doesn't fare so well, and that's a forward-looking uh, projection. And Montana ranks only 30th in the council's economic outlook rank, um, which is based on how well the state's done in 15 different state policies. So um, states with lower tax rates, lower debt, and fewer government restrictions generally have better and stronger economic outlooks according to the uh, American Legislative Exchange Council, which puts out the Rich States, Poor States uh, report. Um, the 15 factors upon which the states are ranked include, and, and I think this says a lot about Montana's, uh, uh, where Montana is, so that they're, they, uh, the categories include property tax rates, sales tax rates, top marginal income tax rates, top marginal corporate tax rate, and how progressive the personal income tax rate is, as well as uh, whether there is an inheritance tax. Um, Montana's 30th place ranking this year reflects a jump, however, of three ranks over 2023 when it was ranked 33rd. So we have made um, a significant improvements over the past year. Um, the data that they presented shows that Montana's state gross domestic product has increased dramatically since 2021. It grew 53.55 percent from 2012 to 22, ranking the state 21st in that category. Population in Montana from 2013 to 2022 increased 87,318 people ranking the state 14th in population growth. And payroll employment increased 15.36% from 2012 to 2022, ranking Montana 15th in that category. Yeah, and, so, and when I hear all these great numbers about how much better Montana is doing, particularly since uh, the first Republican taking over as governor, uh, after 16 years of Democrat governors, you look at how much better our state is doing than all these these blue states. And and it's like, man, imagine how much how how much better we could be doing if we didn't have Joe Biden and John Tester's policies at the national level. Right. It's like it's like we got we got better policies coming out of Helena. And and yet look at the national uh, economic headwinds that we're facing. I mean, imagine how much worse we, it would be right now if if Montana wasn't doing better than these than these blue states if we if we had the same policies as these blue states i mean we'd be in an even, even bigger pinch right now yeah you know um especially in the category of energy montana used to export energy and now then we're very much held captive uh at having to import our energy and uh, in very you know kind of scary situations if if the energy isn't out there on the market to purchase. So, um, and, and we could be making much more money for producing more in the state if we had uh, all the industry that we used to have that generated power that we sold to other states. Yeah, and uh, John Tester is failing to stand up for coal strip. Uh, his environmental wacko buddies uh, killed Coal Strip 1 and 2. Now Joe Biden wants to kill Coal Strip 3 and 4. Uh, all right, Evelyn Pyburn, always a pleasure, always great reporting and insight. If you haven't signed up for the Big Sky Business Journal hot sheet, make sure you do. Always great information and oftentimes information you don't read anywhere else, especially when it comes to very important business news. So thanks to Evelyn. Uh, greatly appreciate it. All right. 406-294-0970, the number for you. Phone lines are open right now. Fox News, I'm Chris Foster. 
Michael Cohen is on the witness stand in New York today, testifying against his former boss. Jurors hearing evidence in former President Trump's hush money trial are expected to finally hear from the prosecution's star witness. Cohen arranged for the $130,000 payment to adult film star Stormy Daniels and later went to prison for orchestrating the payments and other charges. Fox is telling you Jay Powers. Around the corner in federal court, New Jersey Senate Democrat Bob Menendez goes on trial for a second time. Bob Menendez is accused of using his authority as chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee to peddle influence with the governments of Egypt and Qatar and accepting lavish gifts for helping New Jersey businessmen. Prosecutors allege Menendez scored a Mercedes-Benz and more than a dozen gold bars, which were found stuffed into a coat. Fox's Chad Pergram, a senator's wife, faces similar charges. Both say they're not guilty. America's listening to Fox News. You know, I should have saved this story. I should save this story for a woke update of the week when David Noble joins us on Thursdays. But you guys kind of know how it goes, right? I mean, eh, woke updates of the week. It's like now we went from having one woke update of the week to now you got like a dozen different woke updates that we can talk about on the show. Let me see. I think I think I saw this at. Oh, yeah, here it is. This is a Fox News dot com story. Uh, that I want to tell you. This is a business story. Yeah, we can still get back to business here as we move into the open phones portion of the show. Uh, Charlemagne, uh, I, I never use the guy's full self-proclaimed title. He calls himself Charlemagne the God. I don't, it just sounds blasphemous to me, so I'm just going to refer to him as Charlemagne. Charlemagne blames the media for a division, says voters uh, can choose crooks, cowards, or the couch. Basically, um, this uh, this uh, influential, uh, prominent black radio talk show host is really uh, going after Biden. Uh, there's a DailyCaller.com headline here. Charlemagne the God breaks down Trump's potential uptick with black voters. Uh, he says that black voters may shift to supporting former President Donald Trump because of tangible actions he took During his presidency, in a New York Times interview published on Saturday, Trump's backing among black men has jumped in seven battleground states to 30 percent, more than double his support nationwide among this same group in 2020 when he got 12 percent. So uh, that was uh, according to an April poll published by The Wall Street Journal. Uh, Charlemagne, in in the interview, said he believes the uptick is overhyped, but that Trump's policies on the economy – Uh, and on criminal justice are what black voters can appreciate from the former president. But here's the one. Here's the business story that really stood out. I saw I saw a uh, I saw a headline here about how Charlemagne is ripping these, quote, garbage DEI efforts. How many of you work for a business, even a business here in Montana, whether it's in Billings or Bozeman? And you've had to sit through one of these stupid diversity, equity and inclusion training sessions. How many of you have had it? I know I know some of you, if you don't work for a local Montana bank, if you work for one of the big national banks, you've had to sit through the stupid DEI seminar. Listen to what Charlemagne says about this. Uh, It's not just white folks complaining about these stupid DEI seminars. Seminars. Everybody thinks they're stupid. But here's the part where you all stop applauding everything I say. The truth about DEI is that although it's well-intentioned, it's mostly garbage, okay? It's kind of like the Black Little Mermaid. Just because racists hate it doesn't mean it's good. And you know I'm right because every one of you has sat through one of those diversity training sessions and thought, this is a bull. And it's not just you. Over 900 studies have shown that DEI programs don't make the workplace better for minorities. In fact, it can actually make things worse because of the backlash effect. All right. Back with your calls right after this. This is where Montana talks. Montana talks with Aaron Flint. All right, phone lines are open for you, 406-294-0970, or you can message us on our Montana Talks app as well. Let's go to Gary in Billings. Gary, thanks for the call. What's on your mind this Monday? Hey, good morning, Aaron. Thanks for taking my call. Yesterday in Billings, there was an article about two gentlemen that are running for county commissioner to replace Don Jones. 
I'm endorsing John Staley to take that place. As I work for John at the Billings Elk Lodge, it takes seven years to go through the chairs. I'm not past the Yola River. So you people out there that want somebody that will do a good job for you, he worked for the Billings Fire Department for 18 years. Great guy. He'll take care of you. So I want to support him wholeheartedly, and I endorse, uh, encourage people to go talk to John. He'll help you out. Is he a, is he a solid conservative? Is he going to support American energy like coal and coal strip? I mean, I know coal strip's a few miles away, but it, you know, it's so important to, you know, the Yellowstone County economy supporting agriculture, supporting coal, oil, gas, et cetera. Uh, cause yeah, I don't, I don't know much about him. Um, I don't know if he's, I don't think he's taken uh, advantage of an opportunity to call into this show. I know, I, but I know Mike Waters, and I know Mike Waters uh, is a solid conservative. He's an Air Force vet, flew flew uh, bombers over Afghanistan in the immediate aftermath of the 9-11 terror attacks. He's a, currently a, a field representative for Senator Steve Daines. Um, and so, yeah, but I don't I don't know much about John other than just his, his resume that you just mentioned. Well, yeah, I, I think they're both good guys. But, you know, John also served in, as fire chief in, in the Colorado. He came from Quincy, Illinois. So, but I know that he's very conservative. He, he wants to help people. So I think that the choices are for the people. And, you know, let's, let's have the best man win. But I think they'll both do a good job. All right. Well, Gary, thanks for calling in. Good to hear from you. Thank you for taking my call. Hey, yeah, no, no need to say thank you. That's my job. Uh, that's my job to take your phone call, but I appreciate the thanks nonetheless. 406-294-0970, the number for you as well. If you got something you want to talk about, yeah, absentee ballots are already out. So if you didn't get yours in the mail over the weekend, you should be getting it soon. And I know a lot of you, you want to vote on Election Day, and you, and you, love, it, and you love voting on Election Day, and I get it. But look, what if... What if for for these important elections here in 2024, what if you, you break from from tradition and you vote early so that on Election Day you can get out there and get other folks to the polls and help them vote and, and help, uh, you know, help with, uh, you know, day of campaigning, et cetera, things like that. So that just just a thought, because I know that's that's been one of the challenges for the GOP is. Is you know a lot of people they want to wait till election day to vote and then and then they don't have as many folks to volunteer to get out to vote and things like that. So just a thought. Uh, let's see. Uh, Senator Steve Daines was on. Uh, let's see who who was he on with? Um, it might have just been a Fox News digital interview, but he was talking about. Uh, let, let me see the headline I got for you here because this will tie in with it. Speaking of elections. Uh, so Senator Steve Daines is the chairman of the National Republican Senatorial Committee. So it's his job to get Republicans to take back control of the United States Senate. Here we go. This is the headline. Balance of power. Senate GOP's campaign chair cautiously optimistic about retaking the majority in the 2024 elections. Subheadline reads this, NRSC Chair Steve Daines is confident but not cocky on the GOP odds of winning back the Senate majority, says we like our chances. And so, you know, one of the questions that this uh, uh, this reporter with uh, Fox News asked him is, you know, talking about how, you know, something something we've covered here on this show before, which is how do you manage, you know, how do you herd these cats, basically, because, you know, St- Senator Daines has been very pro-Trump. He communicates with President Trump very often, uh, but then he's also got to deal with Mitch McConnell and crew there in the U.S. Senate. Well, look, I remember uh, serving with President Trump when he was our president. We had the Republican majority. The four best years I had in this United States Senate was serving while President Trump was in the Oval Office. We got a lot of things done together with Supreme Court justices, tax cuts, great conservation wins, foreign policy wins, Abraham Accords. I mean, just so many wins under President Trump. And through those years, we developed a, a very strong, productive working relationship, a friendship. And now moving into this role, both the president and myself know that one of the most important things we can give to President Trump when he's elected 
is a Republican majority. Because really, one of the very first phone calls a new president makes will be to the Senate Majority Leader because the Senate's in the personnel business. One of the first acts of the new Senate after President Trump is sworn in in January of 25 was moving through the Secretary of State, the Secretary of Defense, the Secretary of Treasury, the uh, Director of the CIA. Uh, these will all be important, very important positions that the United States Senate will be confirming. Can you imagine for a moment if Chuck Schumer were the majority leader and President Trump is in the Oval Office? It would be a disaster. So from the very beginning, the President and I have worked very closely, very carefully, finding candidates we agree on. They're the best candidates that can not only win primaries, but general elections. All right, that was uh, just a portion of that conversation. I think it's about a 10-minute long interview in total. Back into the phone lines we go. George in Billings. Good to hear from you. Okay, maybe not good to hear from you. Apparently couldn't uh, wait on the phone lines there, so that's okay. You can call back in if you want to, uh, 406-294-0970, uh, or uh, send us a message on the app if you're uh, in and out uh, here this morning. Uh, apparently uh, uh, George wanted to say something about Tester's new ad. Uh, and I always like it when you guys tell me about the new TV ads that that you're seeing out there because I, I just don't watch that much TV. And uh, so I don't – so they spend all this money on these TV ads, and then there's just a lot of us that just don't see them or hear them. Uh, so, so, well, like case in point, remember when they, they had that stupid campaign commercial where Chuck Schumer was attacking Navy SEAL uh, Tim Sheehy? Because uh, his ranch, the Little Bell Cattle Company, you know, markets their beef by selling pink hooded sweatshirts and coffee cups and all this stuff. Uh, I didn't even see the TV commercial, obviously, but Evan and Belt saw it. And, man, did it set him off. So so we had I shared a message from him live on the air, and then I went and found the ad. And I was like, oh, this is the stupidest ad I've ever seen. Who are these guys? They're attacking ranchers. Who market their their beef and market their ranch by by selling hats and coffee cups like like so many ranches do that because you got to enhance your pro profitability right now anyway uh, and marketing's important but anyway so th it looks like we got George and Billings back on the phone lines uh, George thanks for calling hey thanks Aaron for taking my call sorry I hung up on you inadvertently I, that's I, all right uh, heard noise in the background. Uh, yeah, I was sitting watching the ball game yesterday, and uh, John Tester's new ad came on, and I just about fell out of my chair. Have you seen it? He says, I'm working with Republicans to shut down the border, and we need to shut down the border now. The fentanyl crisis is terrible. And at the end of the ad, he says, and I damn well approve this ad. Oh, good. I'm glad he threw uh, in a tough word there to, to yeah, emphasize his phoniness. Yeah, yeah, he really threw in a tough word at the end. Yeah, yeah what a phony. It was phony. hilarious. I, what a phony. What a phony. Yeah, he's... Everybody that, that votes for him is out of their mind. Yeah, there's a handful of them out there. You know, I've been doing these events across the state, and you'll still people that, that they are so... Uh, they just, they're in such denial that they don't care how bad things get. You know, you could have gotten laid off from Riverstone Health, and you would still vote for Joe Biden and John Tester. Right. Uh, you could you could lose your union job at Coal Strip. And there's probably one guy who will still vote for John Tester out there. Right. Well, maybe not. Maybe not Coal Strip. But but you get the point. It, it just amazes me that anybody would support that buffoon. He's a liar. And he, he, he just lies, lies, lies. Well, I've got a, and I've got, speaking of the border, I've got a, a story on our Montana Talks website right now. In case you missed it, Senator Tester flip flopped on the Lake and Riley Act. He just voted against the Lake and Riley Act about a month and a half ago or, or so it was. But now he says, oh, I'll support it if it makes it to the Senate floor. But Chuck Schumer has said he's not going to allow it to get to the Senate floor. Do you notice you notice the the uh, the cheesy little way that this phony is going to avoid voting in support of the Lake and Riley Act? I'll vote for it if it makes it to the floor. Meanwhile, Chuck Schumer is going to make sure it never makes it to the Senate floor. Oh, yeah. They, they think we're idiots out here. They think we're a bunch of idiots. And apparently there are a few. Well, you know, you know what I, I found very interesting is doing these events all across the state with, you know, our friends from Americans for Prosperity of Montana. I've gotten to talk to a lot of people, and I've, there are a lot of people who said, 
Yeah, I voted for them in 2006, and some that even voted for them in 2012, and and they're on to his shtick now. They're like, I'm not voting for him ever again. So that's interesting. A lot can happen in three years, like a chatbot may be your new best friend. But what won't change? Needing health insurance. United Healthcare Tri-Term Medical Plans, underwritten by Golden Rule Insurance Company, offer flexible, budget-friendly coverage that lasts nearly three years in some states. Learn more at UH1.com. Fox News Commentary. Disney World gives Tinkerbell the boot over concern she is a problematic character. Here we go again. I'm Tommy Laren. More next. I'm Charles Payne. Listen to my Unstoppable Prosperity podcast so I can get you making money right now. Whether stocks are hitting new all-time highs or in free-fall mode, opportunities abound. So why are so many potential investors still sitting on the sidelines? In a new season of my podcast, I'm going to get you in the game. After 38 years on Wall Street, I'm ready to impart some lessons and get you invested in the greatest wealth-generating machine in history. Listen anytime, everywhere at foxbusinesspodcast.com or wherever you listen to your favorite podcast. In yet another woke Disney disaster, fan favorite character Tinkerbell has been cut from meet and greets at the park. This comes after the character has reportedly been under scrutiny for being potentially problematic. Apparently, according to some busy body critics, Tinkerbell is too body conscious and also too jealous with Peter Pan's attention. So her wings have been clipped at the park. While images of Tink haven't been totally axed, the character is no longer available for fan meet and greets. Here we go again with political correctness overload that is literally ruining everything innocent and fun. Tinkerbell is an imaginary fairy character. Is it really that deep? Who is actually offended by any of this? Certainly not children. I, for one, am so sick and tired of the social justice warriors nitpicking everything in search of something to be offended by. My goodness, leave Tinkerbell alone. I'm Tommy Laren, and you can watch my show, Tommy Laren is Fearless, at OutKick.com. I'm Guy Benson. Join me weekdays at 3 p.m. Eastern as we break down the biggest stories of the day with some of the biggest newsmakers and guests. Listen live on the Fox News app or get the free podcast at GuyBensonShow.com. 59922. Brought to you from the Montana Hot Spring Spas, the hot tub company that your friends recommend, Studio. Taking your calls live, 406-294-0970. Montana Talks with Aaron Flynn. All right, we're going to get back into your phone calls in the 8 o'clock hour of the show. We'll kick off the 8 o'clock hour with your calls. If you want to call in uh, at the top of the 8 o'clock hour when we hit that 810 break. And then a quick conversation with Grover Norquist around 820. And then back to your phone calls for the remainder of the morning. Hey, it's great to have Dr. Sean Gillis uh, with us on the phone lines from Bozeman this morning. Uh, we were we were hoping to catch up with uh, Dr. Gillis uh, before uh, before uh, taking off for Uganda, uh, for taking before taking off for Africa. But actually, I think this works out even better. I mean, talk about timing. Apparently, Dr. Uh, Sean Gillis uh, just got back from Uganda and is a part of a program called Save the Mothers. Uh, and Dr. Gillis, great to, great to have you on here the day after Mother's Day. Thanks for being with us. Thank you so much. And, yeah, that is really good timing. I'm happy to be here. So tell us, uh, apparently you and several other residents of, of Bozeman are a part of this Save the Mothers program. What's it all about? Well, the, the interesting thing is there are about 800 women that die from childbirth-related complications around the world every day. About 70% of those are in sub-Saharan Africa, and a lot of it is just due to things that we deal with easily here, such as hemorrhage, preeclampsia, infection. Um, But a lot of the rural areas have not really um, figured out how to deal with these things very well. So our program basically goes into rural areas and um, works, works on protocols and ways to identify these different high-risk situations and hopefully treat them earlier. That's incredible. And you're an OBGYN yourself. What was it like on your recent trip in Uganda? Well, it's really it's exciting because there is a lot of work to do. But that being said, there's been a lot of work that's already been done. This organization started in 2005, and so we're just about to hit 20 years. And uh, the maternal mortality rate in Uganda has decreased by 55% in that amount of time. So it's it's challenging but also rewarding. And, um, yeah, happy to be part of it. 
Yeah, beautiful country, beautiful people, a uh, strong faith-based community in Uganda as well. I got to spend just a few days there during uh, my military service. Absolutely, yes. It's it's beautiful being right on the equator, super green, always warm, very, very friendly. How can people get involved or what kind of help do you need with this uh, Save the Mothers organization? Well, mainly we need donations. Our goal actually is to work ourselves out of a job. Our, our goal is to train professionals in their sphere of influence, so lawyers, politicians, educators, media personnel, faith communities, basically to improve awareness and importance of safe maternal health. And so we've had over 500 graduates out of that program, and they go back out into their communities and help effect change that way. And the second one is we're working with the Uganda Ministry of Health to train more skilled birth attendants, so like midwives, um, and then healthy hospitals develop protocols for safe and dignified deliveries. So our goal, like I say, is to work ourselves out of a job, but first we have to get all these things developed. So the main thing is just financial support at this time, and if people would like to learn more about the program, if they go to www.savethemothers.org, there's all kinds of information about the program, what we do, what we've been doing, um, goals for the future, and then ways to get involved. That's so remarkable. It's so great to hear what you're doing and what other folks here in Montana are doing to help people, to travel all over the world, to go help people in their countries. You know, we, we hear a lot of virtue signaling these days and, and a, a lot of people who claim that they want to help other people. But there's so many Montanans that go forth, they go out and they, they say, send me and they go help people all over the world. Uh, remarkable. Dr. Sean Gillis, uh, great to catch up with you. Thanks for your time this morning. Hey, thank you so much for having me on. Have a great day. All right, you too, you too, and, and welcome home. All right, phone lines are open coming up in the 8 o'clock hour of this show. We've got one guest scheduled. It'll be uh, Grover Norquist uh, comparing the tax policies of Joe Biden to the tax policies of President Trump. The rest of the time, open